Okay, I, I think I'll try to be heard. Oh, this, this is not too bad. I can hear myself. Oh, okay. Um, well, I'm, I, I have to tell you a couple of things about myself which, are, uh, which will become obvious as we go on. Uh, one of them is that I have a background as a, a historian and archaeologist. And another is that I have a background in, as a digital humanist. Um, and uh, a, a, an appalling list of other backgrounds, which because it came from the fact that when I got out of school, there were no jobs. Um, so I had to find some other things to do. Um, and I didn't start work uh, in, in uh, teaching at the, at the university level until 20, uh, 2000, um, which, which is when I came to, to uh, UT, um, having just completed uh, working at the Mississippi Department of Archives and History, where I was IT manager, uh, and where we actually created in the year 1999 a digital archives. So what can I say? Um, this is w this is me sort of talking about one of the things that, I, that or several of the things that I think are really important uh, that 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 I have learned, we have learned, my students and I have learned from digital archiving and records management. <clears throat> that uh, can definitely be of application to research management and media preservation. Um, and uh, I was speaking before the, the talk about uh, probably the central idea here um, is that uh, we have not in the past, and um, any of us um, have not in the past uh, really done much to preserve uh, the digital uh, elements of process. Um, and I think that this is really important because it's possible to do um, and because it's, I think, uh, really demanded uh, as, far as, as, as far as actually understanding how, how uh, creativity works and how ideas come to, to the fore. So um, let me see if I can make this work and we will go. Um, this is the issue of uh, the issue of di digital record keeping um, is, uh, is something that everybody sort of say, digital record keeping, I don't know. Um, but the, the idea is that uh, the, the, the desktop interface is incredibly important uh, for the user practice in, in the workplace and at home. Uh, it's basically web, web 2.0 actually it comes into the workplace and the incredible uh, implications for record keeping were really a shock to everyone because uh, one of the things that I see in the United States is that the, the, the states that have not yet started keeping their, their records, the keeping their digital records, are now desperately running to catch up because they, they're now finding that they only have digital records. Um, so, th the, and then there's the whole issue of the blending of work and home. I mean, don't you keep your stuff, uh, all of your stuff on the same laptop? Um, <laughs> no? <laughs> well, then, then you're, you're brainier than I am. But anyway, um, so uh, the whole issue of, of office organization and how it actually got invaded by personal computing, this, this will be pretty familiar to, well, I would have said many of you, except some of you weren't born then. Um, but basically, you know, it started with uh, mainframe computers and people were typing things in uh, the, into databases and whatnot, and they didn't know what they were doing. Um, and then standalone personal computers came in, uh, and people first of all had to smuggle them in, uh, but then they were taken seriously by, uh, the, by the, the staff and whatnot. And uh, then networked personal computers, okay. Uh, internet connected personal computer networks. I have to say that in Mississippi, we were very late to the, to the party. Uh, we weren't internet connected till 1996. Um, and uh, then, Last time, well, not last to, to, to speak of, but wi wireless laptops pretty, pretty soon started coming on to, to be used on the road outside of where you were working. Um, and then finally, smartphones. And I would like to say that what really everybody always wanted, they just didn't want a computer, really. They really wanted a smartphone. And most people only want a smartphone, and they're doing it now. Um, so, so we are the sort of remnant geeks who are needing to use digital facilities to do cool things with, but that's not most people. Um, so it, it, it could be interesting to see how slowly or fast things continue to evolve in our world. So, 
something of uh, that, right? Um, okay, so the, the whole issue of, of uh, I've, I've been doing, running an, uh, a, a study of my students um, over the years where they actually give me um, a digital biography. Um, and uh, basically, the access to personal computers by ordinary people uh, was, was, first of all, it started at the office. Uh, they didn't have anything at home. And so they had to sort of secretly do things at the office, which people were trying to stop them to do. Um, and then home computers became more common. Um, and uh, people got to the internet via dial-up. And I think probably in, in uh, remote villages um, in everywhere, including the US, they still have to use dial-up. Um, and then in the 2010s, the home computers became the norm. And people started, kids started getting laptops as graduation gifts. First it was graduation from, from high school, then it was graduation from junior school, then it was graduation from kindergarten because <laughs> they, they started getting them earlier and earlier. Most of my students now have started, started working with computers or something like them when they were about four. Um, so basically then, of course, wireless, wireless smartphones became standard uh, communication. Um, so then, um, the, this is where I wanted to get. The, the desktop metaphor is, is really important here because um, you, you, it, they, were na they were aimed for at the, from the beginning at knowledge workers. And you can see where they started. The Alto computer in 1978 uh, was at Xerox Park, Xerox Palo Alto Research Center, um, where basically they were, they were treated to those things um, at their desks and the Alto was never marketed, um, but they were able to, uh, every time they would, one of the things that they were able to do was that they had, they wore a badge, and when they went into another room, their whole uh, desktop and contents would load itself into the computer in that room. Very cool, okay, amazing. Um, but basically uh, what happened was they were, the, the, the Lisa, uh, which was uh, uh, an example of Steve Jobs' sort of theft of the ideas that he got from Xerox Park um, in 1982 was actually aimed at executives. Um, and that's why the, the interface was so sort of simplified. <laughs> um, so the thing is that, that, that uh, the underlying research that we had seen, um, it sort of culminated in Malone's essay uh, that, that talked about pilers and filers, that, pe that people could be d divided into pilers and filers, uh, and that the, the, the uh, importance of the desktop should be to, that, to remind people so that they could later find things. Um, we'll look at this in a minute, but one of the things that um, Malone thought was that pilers and filers were just kind of different people, I mean different people with different leanings. I like to suggest that pilers are creatives and filers are people who have got more routinized jobs um, because it's much more easy for them to know where to put stuff. Um, so anyway, this is, um, uh, <laughs> this is where we're going with this. Um, the interface design uh, that, that came out that ended up being used was aimed at accommodating both, both of these, um, the desktop, the, the visual desktop, plus the possibility of looking at hierarchical arrangement when you listed the directory. This is, this is Malone's text, and I'll just, just wait a second. I'm not going to read it out, but note, remind, and find. And note, down at the bottom, automated classification. Um, he's already thinking about this. He was then on the West Coast, and he's been at uh, the MIT Business School for a long time. So, yeah, this is, I mean, this is the thing, you know, it says, and also look at this, the cognitive difficulty of categorizing information is an important factor in explaining how people organize their desks. So, untitled piles and files, legally, logically arranged files. So, onward. So that basically what I'm arguing is that, that the desktop itself has semantic features. Um, you, you've got basically a virtual desktop on a real desktop in a real office. 
and maybe you know you, now what you've got is a is a virtual desktop in not an office at all but a coffee shop um, but basically what you've got is that um, and the, the whole idea of being able to uh, directly manipulate items on a virtual desktop is pretty interesting because it means that you can use you can use spatial meaning uh, which you ob obtain from grouping and the distances from one another of objects now, don't tell me that you're one of these people who just puts things like this like this because most people don't um, and then when you then when you have the option uh, to open something to f that's actually out uh, that's actually dragged from p uh, piles of objects. Um, that's a useful thing. Um, when, you can op when you have the option to open uh, one-to-many uh, relationships through p positionings, um, then finally, I mean, it, it really reminds me, you've probably seen these, um, and you may, may have participated in these, these post-it exercises and workshops where everybody sort of gets to the wall and starts putting up post-its and groups them and regroups them and this and that. It's very much like Maybe it's even inspired by uh, the desktop metaphor. In other words, one of the things that's going on is logically fuzzy and temporary classification. Okay. So this is one of the, le the lessons of the desktop metaphor. Um, you have to actually uh, allow piles um, and uh, you can even uh, limit the number, but even but 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 people, many people have had. How many people have more than one uh, screen connected to their computer they're working with? Okay, there you are. Okay, there you are. What can I say? Uh, you you just have got to have a lot more acreage. Um, but it, it's the whole issue is also that you need to be able to al allow deferred classification. To, to actually enable that desktop's affordances for knowledge creation. Um, you will be reminded by visual representation um, and to enable your finding by prioritization and prioritization, rather. Um, and basically, the desktop itself becomes an assistive thing for your process, thought process. Um, that actually stands in for invisible digital files. They've gone invisible. You can't actually look at them. But there you are, and there it is, a symbol. So, when I first went into information science and I had to learn about sense making, I thought, what? But anyway, it, it says what it means. Um, and basically, what we're looking at sense making and what, what they have, would have to say about this um, is basically what's going on is that users are creating whatever they do, piles, messes, um, as a way of arriving at meaning. Um, users create their own tentative folders, um, which create categories. Folder hierarchies invent ontologies. Over time, folder hierarchies can be manipulated into in order to change ontologies. Um, so the whole issue is it becomes uh, a usual and possibly more inventive way of working because you actually can see what you think. So lessons from personal information management, that's PIM. Do you have this around here? Do you think about this? Well, anyway, um, this is, again, the issue of uh, having external reminders to support memory. Um, basically, people, as the, the, the literature shows, uh, remember by association with people and time. Um, and these are two projects that have made, it, uh, made that obvious and that's, that, are, that have demonstrated that. Um, the individual concern with record keeping um, varies with time, but no matter what their age, people all want to keep most stuff available for a medium time. Now, and, and, and now they can, because, I mean, if you can go and buy, you know, a, a, a two terabyte um, hard drive for not very much, um, you can probably keep it. Um, in the My Life Bits project, they actually thought that a terabyte would be enough for anyone during their lifetime. They didn't. They learned something else from that. <laughs> but anyway, 
Um, but but then the, these things then vary by the uh, the age of the person and the age of the record uh, and frequency of access. I had a student who did a PhD uh, on on just that, uh, looking at at uh, private people who actually had collections and uh, and what they had and what they were trying to preserve. Um, and she was actually able to find some people who were old enough to to be concerned with. Uh, with legacy, and uh, who also had used computers the whole time. That was hard to do, but anyway. Um, so anyway, with the, the, the whole issue is that, that what, what we have learned about this is that when, when you've got the support of surrogates, people can actually remember a bunch of stuff. Um, and that, I mean, that should have been obvious from the seven plus or minus two thing, which, which, which initially actually included clumping things together um, so that you could remember a lot more than seven plus or minus two. Okay, lessons from ev evolutionary biology don't hold me to this. Um, <laughs> but um, basically the, the concept of emergence um, and what we're talking about here the, uh, for emergence is of understanding and meaning from alternative arrangements. Um, there's the, also the notion of order for free, um, the whole being greater than its parts. Um, the, the notion of uh, self-organization, um, and we know that that happens in evolutionary biology, um, and I suggest here that, that this tends to happen when you, when you can see things in front of your eyes and think about, oh, there's a connection between these things that I didn't think about before. Um, the, and farther, finally, of course, collaboration, as we all know, or that's why we're here, um, is a good environment for emergence. Um, and uh, of course, like-minded people can be discovered in Web 2.0. And you don't actually have to use uh, an identifier to do that. Um, I can find anybody in about two minutes. Um, so. So, lessons from information retrieval. Um, any information retrieval specialists in the room? Ah, oh, good, well, okay, you can hold me to it. Um, basically, you have to look, you're, you're doing this to look at larger patterns, obviously. Um, and what's interesting is that uh, text mining, which is, has been around for a good while, I have to say, though, I had to send one of my students who finished her PhD in 2008 um, to the business school, oh, sorry, I, to, to, to learn about text mining because the only person who was teaching it on campus was there. Um, and uh, at, anyway, so the, the text mining at, is a wonderful tool for uh, functional analysis and can also be used behind what one of the things we'd like to do is uh, interactive taxonomy construction, which is happening in some places. Um, Systematic derivation of structure using non-lossy methods is what we've got available to us. I mean, it can be, I mean, it, if you want people, I suppose you can do, use the mechanical Turk, but there are a lot of other things that you can do as well. Okay. So lessons from knowledge management. I'd like to suggest that the value of information assets may outweigh the potential cost of, their, of the risks. Um, one of the things that we see in knowledge management and in, in records management in general is that accountability is important and it usually depends upon compliance of some kind or other with law or something else. Um, and basically it requires context, but what isn't context? I just leave that question in the air. Um, one of the things that's interesting to me is that uh, some years ago, um, I, I, I went to a records management conference and uh, there were people, you know, a lot of people who were showing their products uh, in conjunction with that conference. Um, and I was, trying to sort of wrangle a, 
a, a free USB stick um, from, <laughs> from these people who were giving them away. So I had some discussions with them. They were actually providing a records management system. Um, and I sort of asked, because it was something that had started to occur to me, um, you know, uh, I wonder whether you're, you've thought about giving uh, people who buy your records management system uh, the, the tools that they would need to do digital discovery, which is legal discovery. Um, and they said, no, but that would be interesting. And in another six months, I'm not, I'm not saying it was me, but I mean, in, in six months, they were selling it. I mean, they were actually providing digital discovery tools. And, and now that's standard in records management systems, uh, that digital discovery tools are used to sort of see whether there's any um, risk for anything. Um, since mo most, well, I'm more, I won't say most, but since more of what people are preserving is actually data, that they are making money from. Um, they need to make sure that they're also uh, not running any risk from it. So that's very interesting, but it also has meant that such tools um, are available and are being used and have more history behind them. Um, and then what we look at then at that point is uh, why are they using them and why are they useful? It's because they're using, they're using them to find classifications. They, they're using them to, to rank something as to risk. So basically, we know that each community of practice needs its own classification and its retention ideas, um, but classifications always change. So okay, what do we do about classification? Um, is there a 2.0 classification? Um, sense making and emergence. Memory prompts to individual creativity. Data mining gives us patterns. Visual classification actually allows us to start thinking about classification. Sorry, visual classification is, is it is actually encouraged uh, by the direct manipulation of the desktop. Um, the, the, one, once we actually look at so-called worthless files, especially if we're exposing them uh, to the world, you suddenly discover, of course, that uh, there must be at least a million people on the planet who want to look at that, uh, which you never knew before. Um, then there's the whole issue of tagging versus classification, and and, and the, the, the notion that, okay, folksonomies are a waste of time, which we had a, a fad of, and then people w walked away from it. But that doesn't mean that uh, classification or tagging by experts is a waste of time. Um, and that self-organization happens, and it's a temporal process. Um, the, the whole idea of uh, I, I want to turn on its head the idea that communities of practice define internal classification. Um, I'd like to suggest that internal classification defines community of practice. Okay. Okay. So here's me. Okay, this is me stepping aside and saying I'm the observant archivist. Um, classification is hard. <laughs> It's hard specifically because it takes place in history. So it means it's always going to change. Um, now we've actually made the creative worker um, much more creative by offering them an environment in which, they can, in, which, in which they can actually manipulate their ideas so as to generate fuzzy or emergent classifications. So the issue is maybe it, it will be necessary, at least on the borders of chaos, to trade disciplinary unity for real innovation. So okay, how are we gonna make an excuse for that? Um, <laughs> the, the, I don't know if you're familiar with the, the notion of hold categories, but uh, 
in the legal world and in the records management world, um, if you've got a record that uh, may be that that may affect an ongoing uh, legal case you put it in a hold category, which means you, you have to keep hold of it, you have to not destroy it um, before the, the, the legal uh, activity is uh, completed. Um, so it, this, is, this is something that uh, we can actually look at as hold categories, uh, by hold being, from our point of view, um, keeping it until we know what it is, um, and basically, you, you can look at it by locations, for example. Um, not presently classifiable would still be on the desktop. Belongs to multiple projects might have a lot of shortcuts to connect things to multiple, to connect files to multiple projects. Um, so the classification is, is starts to be seen between, through uh, relationships between files. Hence, this means that you can actually do management through uh, keeping, a, a, keeping a record of process through snapshots of, disk, of, of desktops, um, so you can have multiple temporal states. Periodic harvesting of fo folder names from directory trees and participatory taxonomies. Um, I think really the, the whole issue of this, uh, well, the whole issue of periodic snapshots of desk desktops has actually been, been implemented um, and is available, except that it's not clear that people save them. Um, and and the, the, his the issue of public harvesting of, uh, periodic harvesting of folder names, we do that all the time as archivists so that we can actually see what the structure is uh, for when, when we, we uh, acquire, say, for example, a hard disk. Um, so uh, these are things that, that are perfectly, we're perfectly capable of preserving if we want to. Okay, some examples from academia. Well, kind of from academia. Um, Mesh uh, is very interesting because it invites comments, not from the world at large, but from uh, doctors and researchers in medicine. Uh, and they update regularly. That's where we're going to go here to, to the notion of participatory taxonomies. Um, and then, uh, there, then of course, uh, I, I'm going to cite the a student that I had, uh, the same one who was uh, learning how to do text mining, um, doing uh, an appraisal of a complete records corpus where uh, she actually had all the records that had been generated by a, uh, a small grant-giving agency in Argentina uh, that had uh, been in, in, in activity for probably 20 years. Um, and in Argentina, anytime any entity closes down, um, they, at least at that time, had to retain all of their files for 10 years afterwards in case of procedures against, um, I guess. But anyway, um, so she was actually able to work with the entire uh, sort of, because they had a, a shared in, environment. Um, and was able to actually find out some very interesting things about their activities as a result. Um, so that when you have the whole thing, you can actually find out. I mean, in some ways, it was like um, text mining uh, a computer-supported cooperative work environment. Um, so then, uh, I don't know if you are <coughs> familiar uh, with the work that was done on the Enron email data. Anybody's heard about You've heard about that, okay. You, you've heard about all this stuff, okay. <laughs> um, so the, the Enron data was, it's very interesting because this is a, a part where a lot of people participated. I think it was Carnegie Mellon that actually stripped out all the headers that actually people worked with uh, from the email. Um, and then people, and then a lot of people did a lot of work uh, on visualizations of it. And as a result, one of the things they discovered that was, is sort of most telling, I think, of anything else, was that the two people who were later discovered to have been the most guilty parties had no emails at all. Well, what can I say? But anyway, uh, who, who knows what that, why that, what that means, but um, definitely it's the case that, that serious work has been being done on these things as projects. Um, 
Then uh, there are current uh, things that are going on with, uh, with p personal information management uh, in the wild, um, all the kinds of things about uh, cloud services and how people use them, um, parallel directory trees, um, and whether they do use them, whether they blend them or not, et cetera. Um, and this is this, and then also there's just the stuff that we've always been doing as archivists. Um, we've always been doing classifications after the fact. We get the collection, um, and then we decide how we're going to classify it, and whether we're going to classify it in multiple ways, which we now have the possibility of doing, um, and providing people access, and even providing them with the chance, as many museums have done, uh, to sort of say, make my collection and let me pull out all the things I'm interested in. Um, not that it's been as successful with, for museums as it has been for Pinterest, but anyway. Um, so there's, these are a few, a few examples. Um, so pre preliminary conclusions. I, I'm, I'm going to stomp on this pretty hard. Um, the desktop environment assists deferred classification. Um, these kinds of classifications exist. Um, they, uh, they include things like file naming systems that people have devised for themselves, um, locations and relations between files. The confluence of uh, interactions on the desktop is very interesting to look at, and that is, is something that uh, we don't really understand very well. Um, the fact that classifications that are emergent from knowledge work do have value, um, and this value can be managed by the things that I just mentioned. <clears throat> okay, um, now we're not on the desktop anymore. Hey, we don't do that anymore. Um, <laughs> the internet emerges to link everything in the, in the early 1990s. That was the end of the line, right? Okay. Um, in the 2010s, the desktop opens up to the cloud. So now you've got this connection that's, that's now plaguing people who have been attacked by, the, by a virus. Um, so now we've got the use of uh, design and usability to think about this. Um, and again, I'm st still making my same point. Um, to look at the kinds of things that people have done and the kinds of things that people have, without sort of calling it that, um, trying to program for. Um, these are various uh, examples of desktop innovations that have happened. Um, live streams is, uh, you may be familiar with, um, David Galertner uh, unfortunately had, I think, one of his hands damaged by the Unabomber, um, so that's how old that was. Um, and Freeman was one of his students. Um, you probably won't see the the rooms thing because it was back uh, in it was back in the early 90s, I think. Uh, Bump Top, however, is still online. You should go look at this um, because this was a, a a creation that was made to. Um, it was made to actually, well, one of the students who, who worked on it was uh, a physicist. So the stuff was, the, the, the materials that we, you were putting down on the, on the desktop were made to behave like paper. So that if, you, if, you, if, you, if you managed to tip over a pile, it would fall out the same way. And so, so that was all cutesy, but basically they then actually worked out a bunch of, uh, of uh, um, gestures that you could perform in order to sort things in different ways, et cetera, et cetera. So you, you would have that. It, it's, it, it's, it's still in existence. Um, I'm not sure whether, you know, how long it will be, but it, it, really, uh, it, it really is worth looking at. Um, and then, again, the, the Microsoft Vista and, and Macintosh Le Leopard, Snow Leopard uh, desktops offered a whole bunch of stuff. That, was, that sort of goes forward towards these kinds of things. Um, and then, of course, there's the endless desktop that you can scroll with now with, with a, a Windows 10, which I hate. OK, well, anyway. Um, so this is, these kinds of things have really led to basically bringing web services and cloud computing onto the existing desktop. 
So basically you can't say, well, it's too confusing because there's this, this over here and this over here and here's my desktop. But now you've got them all. The big question is, you know, where, how, do you, how are you going to know what's from where? Well, that's something that's useful. Um, okay. Um, these are things you probably are all familiar with. Um, the long tail, the wisdom of crowds, ambient findability, um, Web 2.0. Uh, basically, uh, these what are what are the things that that devolve from this? New practices for data manage management, and and what has been seen is in fact keep it all, filter in multiple ways, and. We were talking, film studios have always done this. Um, so uh, this would not be too big, I mean, this is when they were an analog version, but this is basically what they've always done. Um, it's, it'll be very interesting to see what they actually do uh, with the preservation of pieces and parts and, uh, and with uh, uh, editing revisions and whatnot, um, because Again, process should be possible to preserve until you realize that you don't need it anymore. So, some new features for Desktop 2.0 have happened. Um, those, those are the, the ones that I've listed. Um, that I, I don't know if, if I, I, most people have not realized how long, uh, you, if, you mouse o if you moused over a Windows file name, uh, you would uh, actually be able to get metadata from it. Um, and most people don't even know that happens because they don't hold, it, hold the mouse over the file name long enough. Um, but that, that, that was their sort of deal for um, uh, persuading people to, um, persuading people to, uh, to put metadata in. Nobody ever puts metadata in, of course. Uh, so then, finally, uh, there's the, the issue of the externalities, which I just mentioned, um, and the fact that uh, basically by pulling in the, w the web, uh, you actually are pulling in functions that are outside of your computer, but that you, the functions may be delivered to your computer. And it's, there's, no, there's no evidence that's obvious of where it's come from and what kind of process it underwent before it came. So, okay. Um, if you're a millennial, you're doing all these wonderful things, and we're just sort of sitting there thinking, I'm not sure I know how to do this. Um, but uh, that's kind of, it's kind of interesting because, um, not to put too fine a point on it, um, the, the, I want, to say, I want to say the desktop, but it's not a desktop. The, the, what's available to most people who, who spend most of their time on their uh, smartphone is, is, has been made extremely simple um, so that they don't actually, and, the, and they don't, they're not con concerned to do anything except search for things or enjoy things. Um, so that that's, uh, that, that's not actually a, an environment in which people are doing a lot of thinking. N no offense, but I mean, that's not what, that, that's not what it's there for. Um, so when you look at the personal use of the cloud, everybody does everything there. Um, does anybody see anything here that they don't do? Maybe not Ravelry. Anybody knitters a knitter? No knitters? <laughs> okay. Well, I, I was going to you know, turn you on to Ravelry. But anyway, um, the, 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 there are all these different things that are being, are being done um, that, that people are making use of. And we, these are things that we don't really know how to deal with. Um, New workers are bringing changes to the workplace, and then basically we, we're wanting to, to actually have uh, all of these connections made. And uh, these are people who these are people who are uh, are ter perfectly at home with this, um, but not necessarily at home with everything that gets done. So, for example, when I'm uh, asking my students to uh, work on 
uh, a digital file that comes from somewhere that mustn't be changed at all, um, then I have to tell them, sorry, but you're going to have to use this particular closed system that's running Linux, that's not connected to the internet, because I don't want anything to happen to this file. Whereas they think that they can actually just, okay, fine, let me just bring it up on my Mac. <laughs> and first of all, it won't come up on your Mac. Um, and and that's, that's part of the issue is that people, have, things have been made easy for them to use, and so when they come to uh, use it for a, a specific creative purpose, they really don't understand enough about it to do so. And maybe that just it means that we're going to have to wait longer until things get simplified more. But um, that's really an interesting question. Um, but the, the whole idea of, of this technological convergence, which is, is what the people are calling it, it's sort of a, uh, a whole new transformation. Um, transformation, I think they're calling it, yeah. Um, this is uh, very interesting that uh, we had, there were two, uh, do you have April Fool? That, the first of April, everybody, makes jokes, okay. Um, well, in 2009, there, here were these two April Fool's jokes. Uh, the Guardian net newspaper was alleged to be shifting to tweets. And the, oh, everybody just laughed and laughed and laughed because of course the Guardian was serious. But they do have tweets now and a lot of them, okay. Um, Elsevier, uh, Springer, and Wiley Blackwell would, would merge. That was thought to be unthinkable. Now that, that it's happened, okay? Um, so all of these kinds of things, this, this whole sort of uh, convergence is, uh, is, is, is there to be seen pretty easily. Um, and the whole issue about the all digital all the time, um, it's, it's a good thing if, you can, uh, if your work and your play are the same thing. Um, and if your, uh, your life tasks are, are easily done using only Google. Um, but, this, but, th this is, but that's the fact, is that it's all digital all the time. And basically, uh, it, it links to media convergence. Unfortunately for the workplace, um, Record keeping has become, has sort of gone crazy um, because people are not actually easily available, uh, are not actually easily um, able to uh, preserve things the way that records managers would like them to preserve them. Um, they, 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 they use all, all kinds of web services for various things. They, they, they will schedule, schedule using doodle polls. They will uh, do all kinds of things, but, and they, of course, are still devoted to the subversive desktop metaphor. I hope you realize it's subversive now. Um, so uh, basically what's happening is that, that uh, they're avoiding restrictions on technology. Um, maybe, maybe well, and if you haven't read Cory Doctorow, you should read him. It, it's, that's available online free. Um, and, but the hacks are not such a great idea. Um, we hope that they will fail, but anyway. Um, so here's, here's the issue of the centrality of Google. Um, that's really interesting, as that, that uh, people using Medline Plus, which of course, and Medline Plus is pretty advanced. Um, preferred to search generally using Google. Well, you can imagine what they got using Google. Um, and then uh, a, a uh, CACM article, um, it's uh, Communications of the Association for Computing Machinery, uh, which is the biggest uh, CS uh, organization in the U.S., um, it, it sort of, it, it, it actually, as early as 2009, was said that Google Scholar citation accuracy was better than ISI Web of Science. And that's what's a standard that's being used for us, you know, the whole time. So, um, and then finally, Google Books. In the early days when Google Books had first started, they had only a few things in. And you could just watch 
as, you went, as it went, as they kept adding one university library after another, that more and more and more things would be available. But of course, it means that they've got the biggest natural language processing um, database in the world um, and, and can do amazing things with it, including finding new grammatical structures that nobody ever saw before. So, this is what uh, Marta Strickland has, has sort of pointed out as being what Web 3.0 is. Um, and so, semantic web, uh, AI slash analytics. Uh, personalization, well, that's an inarguable. Um, mobility. Um, but then, uh, some other people have argued that, that uh, it was all implicit in Web 2.0. Um, so, that this is not really a new thing. Um, Responsive records management. Let's take me. Let's take you back to this. We we refer to it as as archivists. We refer to records management as the dark side. Um, basically, if uh, desktop activity is valuable, um, one of the things that records management people used to always say was, "Let's just get rid of it if we don't have to absolutely have to have it because it's risk." Um, if Web 2.0 is constantly spawning all kinds of useful ideas. Maybe it's not a good idea to make people give it up. Um, and finally, what Web 2.0 applications do you want to get rid of? Anybody got a pet one that they don't like? <laughs> right, what's not to like, okay? Um, so the records management people, first of all, they decided that they were gonna, you know, really, really lock everything down. They loved SharePoint. Anybody who, who in the room who loves SharePoint, please stand up. Um, but anyway, they loved SharePoint. Um, and uh, this is just amazing. Um, and they thought you know, that this was the way to do it. Just lock everybody down, make everybody do everything specifically in, a, in a one specific way. Um, if possible, make everybody use templates, um, et cetera. Well, that didn't really work very well. Um, all kinds of things started to happen because people would ha people uh, started to buy or rent uh, private clouds. Um, they had they might have a whole bunch of, of vendors, not just SharePoint. Um, they might have uh, uh, the, uh, the the users were were definitely always integrating their private and work records. And the minute they were actually allowed to use a laptop that they owned in order to do work. Um, that was going to be worse than ever. Um, and so the problems are, as you see, there are all kinds of issues that have arisen as a, as a result. And especially, there's no really good way to integrate applications um, and no way to actually pull out work records from private records. So finally, um, records management got to the place where they, where, where they would start to say, well, Maybe the user should be in charge, and maybe they should decide. And so hence you have, they, have, they choose their applications. They actually may capture records at the desk. Um, they may do record classification via tagging and folksonomies. And of course, there's still problems, but um, maybe it doesn't matter to tease out work records. Maybe you want to know whether they had a headache that day. Um, and that's the kind of thing that uh, their st the records managers are starting to get sort of adjusted to. Um, because they were, they, it, it was not possible, the, the things that they were thinking that people should do, it was not really possible to get them to do. So this is an interesting book uh, that came out uh, several years ago uh, by the guy who is a, an advisor of records management um, to uh, JISC, uh, the, the British uh, university organization, um, and it's called Managing the Crowd. Uh, what's really interesting is it, it's definitely from a records, management's point, rec records manager's point of view um, because uh, it talks about the user investment but acceptable to the records management community. Hello, you didn't say, it doesn't say appropriate to the user community. Um, but, but this is pretty straightforward what, what the issues are. Um, in fact, he actually, uh, one of the things he talks about is uh, that, you know, why not keep it all? Oh, that's so daring. 
Um, the guys who are who are the records managers for the county of uh, what's what is my county? What is my county? Uh, Travis, Travis County, which is where Austin is. Um, they decided they were going to keep it all email, keep all email, and they went went around to various meetings of records managers and started talking about it, and people started looking at them as though they were insane. Um, but they had, you know, they had some really useful things to say, and and uh, and they, you know, th they weren't going to make everything public. It was just that they really felt that it was a lot easier to just keep it all, um, and uh, and deal with it later. Um, and as that, you know, often is the case. How many people have actually turned off all of the things that are coming in as junk? Um, and how often do you have to do it to keep it from coming in? <laughs> So, okay, so finally, this is basically me sort of saying that documentation is valuable, and that means documentation of process. Uh, don't make it, don't call it user investment, Use, call it user construction. Get the user to actually see that this is, that, to stand back and look at what they're doing on that desktop and realize that they're making stuff. Uh, and, and that that's a part of it. Um, that it, it's often assumed that users are bad record keeper, re, bad record keepers. It's often assumed that um, workers for uh, governments are bad workers. Um, actually, having been one for 20 years, um, I got to tell you, most of the people that I knew were pretty much just in there working as hard as they could because they wanted to do a good job. Um, and basically, that's what they—that's what people are doing. They're keeping records as well as necessary to do their jobs, and of course now also to live their lives because they have to keep records for that too. Um, and so they always do these things. They classify. They prioritize. They schedule. Um, their their behavior and use will tell you more about the records than management by somebody who doesn't know what they're talking about. Um, one of the things that records managers do is sort of sit there and decide what categories things belong in. And the people have to then be trained as to what category it belongs in. And then when the person leaves, somebody else has got to be trained. So the training is a never-ending procedure for records managers. Um, so that, that is really important. But that, and then finally, the, the issue of uh, user information behavior uh, is important, particularly from creatives. You want to actually, or, or they themselves want actually to see what it is that they are doing. And most of the time, you have to actually take something outside yourself in order to see it. And the desktop is a reasonable place to start. So, also, keeping more um, doesn't take any space, does it? Um, and for a creatives, really, that I think it's, it is, process is as valuable as product. Um, if you uh, have to uh, copy a whole methods library, to, uh, this is one of the things I saw uh, that, um, it was, it was a geneticist who was sort of saying, okay, well, I'm writing my Python script, and every time I try to run it, somebody else, sort of about three levels down, has done something to the, to the library, and it doesn't work, because I don't have any control over that. Uh, and who's, in, who's supposed to be in control over that? Um, one of the things that, that other people have, have proposed as, as a, a practice is to, okay, so if you've got something like this that you're definitely going to be dependent upon, then maybe you should actually copy it and keep a, keep a, a version of it um, that, that works with your, your code um, and so that at least you have it until you're finished with the project. And so people are doing that because, after all, Storage is free, um, and at least for the, for the short term, it is free, or relatively free. So there's that. Okay, so here you go. This is all I have to say. <laughs> uh, the desktop model for user creativity is important, and I hope you will look more at the desktop than you have looked before. 
Um, Web 2.0 is going to be is going to be here from now on. From now on, only it'll you know it'll be more different or more or easier or maybe who knows how. But it's going to keep changing. <clears throat> and one of the things that's interesting about it is that, as far as you're concerned, when you're actually looking at whatever manifestation there is externally of what people are doing is that it actually is exposing information flows, not only for the delectation of whoever uh, employs the, the worker, uh, but also for the delectation of the worker, the creative worker especially, him or herself. Um, records Knowledge Management 1.0 will not scale in this environment. Uh, the making of the digital record uh, is about process uh, that, and, and thinking that process is also valuable, uh, just as digital tools are valuable, um, and ju just as digital tools are available to, in order to analyze those things. We haven't been able to do that because we haven't been able to scale before. Um, so, to my mind, this is really one of the most important things, is that process is really important. We've always, you know, it's, it's ended up in literally the cutting room floor. Um, and if we, if, we do, if we play our cards right, uh, we won't have to do that anymore. So, there you go.